This second generation Honda NSX, like its predecessor, takes the fight to Ferrari in the junior supercar sector. And like that earlier model, it goes about the task a little differently. What should a supercar be? Well, we know the European answer to that question. It's a formula personified by Ferrari, echoed by McLaren, and likely evolved by the handful of less exotic premium brands who've dared to enter this rarefied segment. What you get in each case is a race car for the road. What you need, says Honda, is this. Welcome to the NSX. The name may resonate because the earlier generation of this model, launched back in 1989, had such a profound effect on its sector. Here was an exclusive junior supercar as focused as any Porsche or Ferrari, but a machine that could be as undemanding to own and drive as a Civic. Now the letters stood for New Sports Car Experimental, and when Honda experiments, the automotive world sits up and takes notice. Now they certainly did with the early NSX. The styling was inspired by an F-16 fighter jet, and the selling price, well that was pretty much half the cost of the comparable Maranello product of that era, the Ferrari 348. Famously too, the chassis was developed with the help of Ayrton Senna, but crucially, he didn't need his talent to really enjoy it. We'd never seen a supercar quite like that. A machine that an ordinary driver could take near to the limit on the road without frightening and possibly dangerous consequences. A car that wasn't awkward to drive in town or worrying in the wet. Small wonder that the original model stayed in production in 2005. Honda subsequently readying a V10 engine replacement that was supposed to celebrate the success of the brand's return to Formula One. Now that didn't happen. The F1 team floundered and fell victim to that period's worldwide recession, as did the replacement NSX. And that might have been that, had it not been for a dedicated band of enthusiasts within the company who refused to let that model line die. Now finally, the Japanese management relented and a small team from the brand's American Acura division were tasked with reinterpreting what the new sports car experimental concept should mean for the modern era. And this is their response. Launched in 2015 and lightly updated in mid-2018, it's as different from its market contemporaries as its predecessor was from the competition back in the 90s. This time around, the change lies in the way that the car takes the hybrid performance technology used on 750,000 pound hypercars like McLaren's P1, the Ferrari LaFerrari and the Porsche 918 Spyder and makes it available for Porsche 911 turbo money. As part of that, there are no fewer than four motors on offer, a 3-litre V6 twin-turbo boosted by an electric motor together powering the wheels out back, with a sport hybrid all-wheel drive system completed by two further motors powering the wheels up front. This NSX can start and creep briefly on all-electric power, it can flash to 62 miles an hour in under three seconds, it can reach nearly 200 miles an hour flat out, and it's everyday usable enough to feel quite suitable if all you actually need it for is to collect your dry cleaning. This, in Honda's words, is what an everyday supercar should be. And we're going to test it. So, what are we to make of this? An electrified supercar with a battery providing electricity to two small motors driving the front wheels, as well as also to a large one at the back that assists a big 3.5 litre V6 powering the rear axle, which makes this a four wheel drive hybrid powered by four motors. Yes, really. Uh, continuing with the futuristic technology, the brakes aren't actually connected to anything. The big pads are activated uh, virtually and the steering works in much the same manner. If, as a committed driving enthusiast, you're seeking an ultimately involving junior supercar, it might not sound too promising a recipe. Honda, though, begs to differ. They've reimagined what a machine of this kind can be, and we're told they've packaged into it a Senna-style dose of pioneering spirit, which means, well, what? We're about to find out.
fire the starter and the engine kicks into life with a snarl that's rich and potent, but it is some way off the guttural blare that you get from a McLaren or a 911, or the highly strung wow that you'd hear from a Maranello V8. Perhaps that's appropriate given that Braun here is provided by battery as well as by braked horses. There are, of course, plenty of those with 500 horsepower generated by the 3.5 litre V6 out back, then a further 73 horsepower contributed by the combined efforts of the three electric motors we mentioned earlier. The one at the back, the so-called direct drive motor, which is wedged between the twin turbocharged engine and its nine-speed dual-clutch automatic gearbox, acts as both the flywheel and the starter motor. Up front, meanwhile, lie the two further 38 HP motors that together create this car's TMU, twin motor unit, which is there to drive the front wheels, provide torque vectoring for extra cornering traction, and to complete the operation of this car's sport hybrid all-wheel drive system. The TMU also recovers braking energy during deceleration to supply power to the hybrid batteries. You can't actually hear the various electric motors, but when you flatten the throttle, you can watch their effect on this Honda's uninterrupted stream of power via a provided assist charge gauge to the left of the rev counter. Now this rises and falls as the direct drive motor and the twin motor unit work together to deliver an electrified boost that smooths over the slight reductions in torque that you'd otherwise find in the upper and lower parts of the rev range. All rival supercars at this price point are frantically fast, but the torque's not always delivered instantly at low engine speeds in low gears in the way that it can be here. Floor the throttle in almost any ratio, and 645 newton meters of torque thrusts you towards the horizon with a throaty roar as you near the 7,500 rev limit, and the kind of urgency that you might expect from something even more powerful, something like a Ferrari 488 GTB, well, maybe not quite. That's a much pricier, lighter car with 100 horsepower more. But this NSX gets closer to the performance potential of that Maranello model than we ever expected it might. Of course, as usual with a machine of this kind, you can dial in various degrees of excitement with different drive settings. Uh, these are marshaled here by this large silver rotary dial, which controls this Honda's integrated dynamic system. Quiet mode's the starting point, in which setting you can leave home in early mornings without waking everyone up, as the hybrid system does its best to remain silently electrified for as long as possible. Before very long, the engine chimes in, of course, but with a muted note that's 25 decibels down on what's delivered by the more sensational settings. Ease the dial to the right and you'll find three of these. Sport adds a gravelly rumble to the engine note and sharpens acceleration. You'll probably, though, go straight to Sport Plus, which turns the throttle and transmission maps up a further notch, while simultaneously stiffening the magneto rheological adaptive dampers and putting the yaw control into a more aggressive mode that'll cut stability system interference without leaving you bereft of assistance should you need it. The final option is track, which you won't be able to resist playing with because it dials aural excitement via the active exhaust valve and intake sound control systems up to the max, and it's the mode that you'll need to activate launch control. That's easily the most effective setup of its kind we've ever tried. It simply hurls you away from rest, 62 mph flashing by in 2.9 seconds. That's a figure in this segment is only matched by Porsche's 911 Turbo. Unlike obvious rivals, the top speed doesn't also begin with a 2, but if you're fortunate enough to find somewhere where you can achieve the quoted flat-out 191 miles an hour limit, well, it's unlikely that you'll care very much. Now that maximum is no doubt slightly hampered by the inevitably prodigious weight that tends to afflict any car that mates electrical output with a turbocharged combustion engine. Here, that leaves this Honda tipping the scales at nearly 1.8 tonnes, and that makes it around 500 kilos heavier than a rival McLaren 570S. Uh, you'd expect a more significant effect of this to be a reduction in cornering agility, uh, but attack a set of twisting turns and you'll feel nothing of the sort. The amount of speed that the Sport Hybrid all-wheel drive system allows you to carry through the bends is astonishing, with corner exit speed especially remarkable, thanks to that torque vectoring twin motor unit on the front axle. 
This whole sports hybrid all-wheel drive setup was recalibrated as part of the changes made to the improved version of this car launched in late 2018, as were the settings of the adaptive dampers, which feel brilliantly judged in the way that they feel purposefully compliant over bumps and racetrack curbs. Plus, as part of those improvements, larger front and rear stabilizer bars were added, increasing stiffness by 26% of the front and 19% of the rear. Uh, the rear hubs and control arm tow link bushings were also stiffened, and grippier Continental Sport Contact 6 high performance tyres were added to the standard spec. All of this further boosts responsiveness through the chassis to the point that Honda claimed the enhanced version of this car uh, to be two seconds quicker a lap around its famous Suzuka Grand Prix circuit. Yet, in Extremis, all of this performance is delivered without the faintly frightening feel you might experience while trying the same thing in a comparable McLaren or Ferrari. Others describe this as a feeling of somehow being kept at arm's length by all the technology, but we'd take this Honda's composed confidence any day over anything in this segment bar a Porsche 911. As for the e-steering and e-braking systems we mentioned earlier, well, they managed to be pretty 911-like too. Fearsome and powerfully responsive. Um, if no one told you of the lack of hydraulic assistance with either setup, you'd never guess it. And we love the way this car has been designed uh, to be so easy to see out of a manoeuvre. Now this attributes just as well, given this Honda's vast near two meter width, and it, uh, it's one that tends to encourage you to use it on mundane urban trips that would probably see more exotic rivals left in the garage. Inevitably, there are, of course, things you probably won't like and others that you'll have to adjust to. The buttons for the 9 DCT Auto Gearbox fall into the latter category, but you'll quickly get used to those. Uh, not so the steering wheel paddle shifters, which feel horrible and click through the ratios with a kind of artificial tactility that you get from a 90s PlayStation. That's unfortunate since in the manual transmission mode that you'll probably want to often use, you'll find yourself using them an awful lot. So closely stacked are the seven speeds that lie between the initial launch off ratio and the ninth one that's reserved for highway cruising. Uh, the lack of functionality allowing you to customize your own settings for the integrated dynamic system driving mode setup is an oversight that you wouldn't find in direct competitors. And it's also annoying that Honda has specified this car with such an extreme low ride height, yet neglected to give it the kind of optional ride lift system that uh, helps so much on ramped driveways, potholes and over speed hubs in the rival McLaren. Ultimately though, none of this will really matter if the other virtues of this NSX enthrall you to the extent that they've charmed us. Don't think of this as an expensive Honda, think of it instead as a cut price hybrid hypercar because that's what it is. Cutting edge technology is rarely characterfully creative, but here Honda's made it so. And in consequence, they've created a memorable machine. It's an established mark of supercar styling that every exterior element should serve a distinct purpose. And that's certainly the case here as part of what uh, designer Michelle Christensen calls the interwoven dynamic approach to this sleek silhouette. Now, she's the first woman to have been given the lead styling job in a car of this kind, and her work here is striking and attractive, though also visibly influenced by the Ferrari 458 and Audi R8 models that Honda purchased to inspire the NSX project team. The brief here was impossibly complex, an exotic look, a recognizably Honda feel, everyday usability and a clear link to NSX lineage. But it's been appealingly interpreted in a manner even lower and wider than that of the car many might see as this one's closest rival, the McLaren 570S. Uh, the various dramatic vents, vanes and creases have to manage airflow over the hand finished panels in a way that's not only aerodynamic, but which also has to somehow contrive to cool no fewer than seven different heat sources, the 3.5 litre V6 engine, two turbochargers, the dual clutch transmission, the power distribution unit, and the two motors within the front twin motor unit. 
10 different heat exchangers are needed to service all these areas and many of them are found here at the front. Even these distinctive multi-LED headlights are bispected by mesh covered air inlets. Each LAMI unit contains six individual LEDs and a narrow slash that flows smoothly into the tapered front grille uh, which creates an aggressive interpretation of Honda's now familiar family face and inevitably more vents feature in the acutely angled sculpted aluminium bonnet. As with the original NSX, aluminium is a key structural component, although this time around other fundamentals also feature. Composite plastic is used as part of the mixed material space frame, plus there's a carbon fibre floor and the A-pillars are fashioned from steel so they can be narrower. In profile, you better appreciate the way that the bonnet line, the roof line, the floating C pillars and the rear quarter appear as one distinctive and unified curve. It all combines with remarkably short front and rear overhangs to create a sleek yet muscular overall stance that properly conveys a required sense of purpose and power. Uh, the large yet lightweight high performance wheel and tyre package fits within the arches with minimal gaps to highlight the torque proportions. Uh, 19 inch rims feature at the front with 20 inches at the rear, both shod with grippy Continental Sport Contact 6 performance rubber. The rear styling's equally striking, most notably for the way that those signature floating C pillars cascade gently from the roof line to a point just forward of this integrated spoiler. That's an attachment that on most rival models would electrically activate at high speeds. Now here it doesn't need to. The combination of the wind tunnel sculpted bodywork and this intricate lower diffuser are already enough to deliver three times as much downforce to the rear as is needed at the front, which in Honda's view is the optimal balance for high performance and day-to-day -day driving. Uh, the rear window glass showcases the engine in a fashion that's now usual in supercar circles. Uh, the 3.5 litre twin turbo is displayed at the gloriously distinctive 75 degree bank angle that references past Honda racing programs. The twin turbo charges are set outside the V in order to keep the centre of gravity lower. And to remind you just how unusual and unique this car is, there's a bespoke build plaque, precision crafted by Performance Manufacturing Centre that being Honda's American Marysville plant in Ohio. And it reminds you that this US conceived creation is now as much an American product as a Japanese one. Okay, time to take a seat inside. Now, there are no gullwing style dihedral doors of the sort favoured by McLaren, just conventional ones that you open with pop-out sticks of the kind that are found on Aston Martins. And they pull back to reveal uh, a cockpit that's lower slung than a 911, but one certainly easier to access than that of a competing Ferrari or McLaren. The cabin design doesn't share much with European rivals either, apart from the way that this large centre transmission tunnel flows between the seats into the centre console. This certainly feels like a place designed to do business with the road. The focus is appropriately centred on this magnesium fashioned wheel that shares its shaping, although not its exotic finishing, with a Ferrari 488. Through it you view a driver focused 8 inch TFT digital display that's dominated by a central rev counter and incorporates a digital speed readout. Flanking this gauge are two digital charge meters reminding you of this Honda's electrified remit with that for the main battery on the right and the left hand one briefing you on the sport hybrid system's current rate of assist charge. As you can see, there's no conventional gear stick, just this McLaren style narrow center console strip, which incorporates the gear change buttons and the electronic handbrake. And that's collectively a setup that you'll quickly adjust to. All of this works pretty well, but quite a few of the materials used to trim this layout feel decidedly low rent by premium supercar standards, particularly the silvered plastic that the design team seem to have been so fond of. It's also used on these horribly cheap feeling gear shift pedals. Having said that, the cabin feels decidedly sturdier and better built than rival cockpits in this sector. And crucially in our view, it's also easier to see out of than anything in the class, bar the far more upright Porsche 911 Turbo. Other interiors in this segment certainly feel more exotic with their carbon fiber and Alcantara finishing, but this one delivers something much more important, ergonomics that make you feel much more confident and uh, comfortable at the wheel than you'd expect to be in a supercar. 
Now, little things contribute here. The narrow A pillars we mentioned earlier, uh, the relatively glassy side profile, and the way that the dash has been lowered to improve the view ahead. All of this makes a small but significant difference to all-round visibility, although it still doesn't excuse the lack of standard parking sensors. Uh, you do get a rear view camera though. In terms of stuff that you won't appreciate quite so much, well, pretty much everyone who's tested this car has disparaged this seven inch center dash Honda Connect color touchscreen, and it's easy to see why. Although Ferrari never seems to get much criticism for borrowing similarly cheap feeling systems from Fiat's and Alphas, given the low volume nature of this car, it was a bit much to expect the Japanese brand uh, to have developed a specific NSX infotainment setup, but they could perhaps have repackaged this one so it wasn't quite so obviously borrowed from a Civic. Um, dated graphics and slow response times characterize the Connect package and rather unforgivably in this segment of the market it doesn't include navigation unless you pay extra although you do get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto smartphone mirroring and a bespoke nine speaker 580 watt ELS studio premium audio system that was created in association with the award-winning recording engineer and producer Elliot Shiner. Thankfully, the main climate controls are separated off below the display, although you do still have to operate the fan speed via the screen. Just below it sits a large silver dial that you initially think might control this monitor so you don't have to stab away at its touchscreen functionality or master the intricacies of voice activation. This though turns out to be a driving mode dial and it's there to enable you to flip through the uh, customizable dynamic and auditory elements of the driving experience. In the car's initial quiet mode, the instrument binnacle display glows a cool blue. Switch the controller to Sport and it takes on a grey hue with red highlights. And finally, in Sport Plus and Track modes, uh, it adopts a yellow hue with red highlights and the rev counter rotates to place its lower and upper limits in more track-focused 6 o'clock and 3 o'clock positions. Surprisingly, you'll search in vain amongst these screens and modes for the kind of stopwatch function that normally is more or less mandatory on a car of this kind. And that's odd, given the extent to which uh, Honda expects likely owners to use their cars on track. Even the headrest of the seat structure is designed to accommodate a helmet. Uh, less surprising is the lack of interior storage, although that hardly fits with this uh, model's stated everyday usable remit. There are no door bins and the glove box, which does incorporate a USB port is small. It uh, contains this twin cup holder attachment that you slot into this aperture next to the passenger seat. Uh, you don't get vanity mirrors in the sun visors or any overhead compartment for your sunglasses either. Uh, the small recesses in the doors and on the side of the transmission tunnel, they're not good for much, but you do get a trinket tray just behind the central gear selector panel and behind that there's a lidded ledged box with USB and HDMI ports. What else? Uh, well, various data functions can be delivered via this little wheel on the right-hand steering spoke. Uh, things like compass, uh, tire pressure, maintenance info, fuel consumption, and oil levels. And one thing we do like about the Connect center dash screen is the way that it can audibly read text messages and emails out to you before allowing you to reply with preset responses like, talk to you later, I'm driving. Uh, there's also access to Google Maps, Google Now, and Google Play Music too, along with a variety of popular third-party Android-compatible music apps and a wide array of uh, sports, financial, weather, and media information apps. We ought also to mention the spaciousness of this cabin. If you thought you might struggle to fit in a supercar, either due to height or weight, then don't worry, you'll have no problem with this one. Uh, one advantage of this design's prodigious width comes with the amount of cabin shoulder room on offer. And there's enough head space for someone, well, comfortably over six foot in height. It's a pity there's no seat height adjustment, but there's plenty of scope for altering the steering angle. And it's easily possible to align yourself comfortably comfortably with the pedals without the need to contort your legs at awkward angles. And now what you don't get are the useful extra little rear seats that arrive on 911 Turbo or Aston Martin DB11 would offer for designer shopping bags or short trips with kids. 
There isn't even the restrictive sliver of storage space behind the seat backs that most two-door arrivals give you. Just behind the headrests, uh, there's a 12 millimeter thick slab of glass. That's the thickest used in any Honda production car, and that separates the cockpit from the engine compartment. Now it's there because the brand wants you to hear the cabin sound that's piped in through the stereo speakers and the dual overhead microphones, rather than the guttural note of the V6 power plant itself. Now that's perhaps one reason why the aural fireworks on offer here aren't quite as thrilling as perhaps they could be. Now, finally, let's take a look in what we should call the trunk, this being primarily an American sports car. No, not the frunk. Uh, boot space in a rival Porsche or McLaren model would be found beneath the bonnet, but the twin motor unit up front in an NSX means that there's no room for that here. So luggage space in this Honda has to be traditionally situated at the back. Now, there is 110 litres of it, which doesn't sound very much, and it isn't. Although, to be fair, rivals don't give you very much more, despite the fact that they don't have to package in all the hybrid systems provided here. Uh, this boot is much wider than it first appears, wide enough in fact to swallow the full size set of golf clubs that the Japanese maker insists will somehow fit. Uh, these will though be lightly sautéed on your way to the links thanks to uh, heat dissipation that comes partly from the big engine up ahead but mainly from the 9-speed dual clutch gearbox that causes this awkward hump in the floor. Uh, small straps are provided just inside the boot lip but otherwise there's nothing to keep small items in place so think in terms of this area swallowing a couple of small suitcases and a squashy bag and then pack accordingly. Honda asks around £150,000 for NSX ownership and sells it via only two of its UK dealerships, both London-based in either Chiswick or Hendon. That's if you can get one. The initial allocation quickly sold out, and so did the second tranche of models. In terms of rarity, this car makes something like an Audi R8 look like a Fiesta. Now, this Honda is hand-built using cutting-edge powertrain technology, and of course, you pay for that. In fact, as we'll see in in just a minute, you'll almost certainly be spending quite a lot more than the sticker price by the time you take delivery. But then that is pretty much par for the course in this segment. Now, rumors abound of Roadster convertible body styles and an even more focused Type R version. But at the time of this test, the autumn of 2018, just after the launch of the facelifted version of this second generation model, just this single coupe variant was being offered with a combined system output of 573 horsepower. As for rivals, well, just what do you compare this Honda to? Now, in a moment, we'll get to similarly priced rivals in this segment that deliver the same kind of performance through more conventional engineering, but the cutting edge hybrid technology on offer here can't be had anywhere else in this segment in quite the same way. Now, it's based on the engineering used by long since discontinued 750,000 pound hypercars like McLaren's P1, uh, the Ferrari LaFerrari, and the Porsche 918 Spyder. In the far more attainable junior supercar, segment this Honda is priced to compete in. The only other car that uses hybrid power is BMW's i8, but that's a very different plug-in setup putting out nearly 40% less power. Still, that BMW does cost over £30,000 less. But let's get to those more conventionally engineered direct rivals, the two most obvious ones being McLaren's 570S and Porsche's 911 Turbo S. Both cars are priced just £5,000 or so below this Honda, and they deliver very similar levels of performance. The McLaren feels more exotic, but it's less well-built, and its low-slung, more temperamental demeanour makes it less day-to-day -day usable. The Porsche is the polar opposite. It's the kind of car that you could commute in and leave in a public car park without being unduly bothered. But it's also a car that's rather too similar in many eyes to humbler 911 variants, costing half as much. Now, many will feel, as we do, that this NSX strikes a very good balance between these two extremes. 
What about the other options you could consider? Well, if you're prepared to look at a Honda in this segment, then there's certainly no reason why you shouldn't also consider an Audi. Uh, now, the Ingolstadt brand's similarly powerful R8 Plus Coupe will save you around £8,500 over an NSX, but it doesn't even feature turbo power, let alone hybrid technology, so it won't appeal to the kind of technophile who'll simply love the idea of this Honda. Uh, a slightly more sophisticated, more exotic-feeling choice is the V8 version of Aston Martin's DB11. That costs only about £5,000 less than an NSX, but it's around 70 horsepower down, and it's really more of a GT than an out-and-out junior supercar. The same is true of Bentley's Continental GT, which in W12 form will cost you about £7,000 more, and that is about it. Maserati can't really field anything in the same league, and the closest comparable Ferrari, the 488, will cost you around £200,000, yet goes no faster. If having considered all of this you conclude it is an NSX that you really want, then you're going to have to be of an understanding nature when it comes to the spec sheet. I mean, is it really acceptable on a £150,000 supercar to make buyers pay extra for parking sensors and navigation? Surely not. On the plus side, the Centre Dash infotainment screen does include a rear view camera and smartphone mirroring via Apple CarPlay or Android Auto. Plus, there's Bluetooth, of course, along with access to various Google powered features and a wide range of third party apps. In addition, via this monitor, you'll activate a bespoke nine speaker, 580 watt ELS Studio Premium audio system. Uh, grippy sports seats finished in Milano leather and Alcantara are also standard, although they're only manually adjustable and you get dual zone climate control incorporating a micron air filtration system uh, which is capable of filtering away particulates as small as 0.3 microns. As you'd expect, there's a set of full LED headlamps with the same technology also used for the daytime running lights and for the tail lamps. Uh, Honda includes an active exhaust valve system with active sound control too, so there's no need for the pricey optional sports exhaust of the kind that competitors offer. And of course, the uh, engineering package is common to all NSX models, including sport, hybrid, all-wheel drive, a 9 DCT paddle shift, dual clutch auto gearbox, and active magnetorheological adaptive dampers. Uh, there's also a mechanical limited slip differential, a high performance Brembo braking setup, launch control and an integrated dynamic system with selectable driving modes, the quiet, sport, sport plus and track settings that we've briefed you on elsewhere in this film. Now a carbon roof is standard as is an exterior sport package and that incorporates a matte black front spoiler, a special rear diffuser and side sills and a bright chromed exhaust finisher. And you get what the brand calls its exclusive interwoven wheels, 19 inches at the front and 20 inches at the back. All rims uh, are able to be specified with your choice of either machined, painted or polished finishes. Also included is what Honda calls its signature interior sport package and that gives you a leather wrapped steering wheel, an Alcantara trimmed instrument binnacle and black pedals. On to options. Uh, it's appropriate to start with the driving stuff. Actually, there isn't much, just the pricey carbon ceramic disc braking system we have here, and that'll set you back a cool £8,400. You can have the calipers finished in either red, silver, orange, or as here in black. And talking of colours, unless you want your NSX's aluminium panels finished in the three standard solid shades on offer, uh, Berlina Black, Curva Red, or the evocatively named 130R White, you'll be needed to pay your Honda dealer extra for the exterior paintwork. Now, possibly you might want a metallic finish, source silver or Nord Grey, or maybe the Casino White or Thermal Orange pearlescent shades. Or you could pay even more for this particular car's exclusive Andaro paint, and that's available in either Valencia Red or is here in Nouvelle Blue. Uh, this test model has been further embellished with the optional carbon fibre exterior sport package. Now that gives you carbon fibre for the front spoiler, the rear diffuser and the side sills, plus a dark chrome exhaust finisher. You can also add a carbon fibre rear spoiler too if you want it. And this car also features the optional carbon fibre engine cover that most customers tend to want. Uh, diamond cut blade style alloy wheels can be specified and we want to protect it all with the optional Lycra fleece line stitched car cover. 
Uh, as for interior options, well, as you'd expect in the supercar segment, you can add more carbon fiber. Uh, now here, that material features as part of the optional interior sport package, which sees it coating parts of the steering wheel and the instrument binnacle. Plus, that pack also gives you an aluminum finish for the footrests and the sports puddles. Uh, there's an optional black Alcantara headliner, and you'll probably want to upgrade the leather and Alcantara seats with power adjustment, uh, in which case, you can uh, have them finished in ebony, orchid, saddle, red or indigo blue. Or you could go the whole hog and get power-assisted chairs that are trimmed in the softer semi-aniline hide that we've been trying here, in which case they can be finished in uh, ebony, orchid or red. Uh, finally, it's very unlikely that any NSX would be delivered without the £1,700 extra pack that gives you Garmin navigation, a CD player and all-round parking sensors. So let's finish with a look at safety. Now we've criticized other supercar makers for failing to include camera driven safety kit features like autonomous braking on their cars and we're equally disappointed to find that sort of thing lacking here. Why should the Honda sensing package of camera driven safety elements that you get on the Civic not be offered here? It's simply unacceptable. You can't even specify adaptive cruise control and that's just as bewildering an omission given the long distance driving that many owners might engage in. Of course, uh, you do get plenty of more conventional stuff, uh, and that includes a tyre pressure monitoring system with location and pressure indicators. And there's also a particularly clever VSA, Vehicle Stability Assist with Traction Control Setup. Now, this constantly monitors key dynamic parameters and driver inputs, such as steering angle, uh, throttle position, yaw rate, uh, lateral g-force, uh, vehicle speed, and individual wheel speeds. Now, if oversteer or understeer is recognized, then the VSA system, that's working in conjunction with the sport hybrid all-wheel drive layout and the power unit, is able to instantaneously redirect torque and invoke the ABS braking system at each wheel as needed to help stabilize your NSX. Now this uh, system also increases traction and reduces wheel spin when there's reduced grip, such as in wet, icy or snowy conditions. Now, if none of this is enough to prevent you from having an accident, then you'll be glad of the way that this car's advanced multi-material body design effectively manages energy in a collision, minimizing cabin intrusion and mitigating occupant injury. Ablation cast nodes in the aluminium structure have been fitted at key junctions within the front of the car's space frame to help optimize impact protection. And to guard against fire in a rear end collision, there's a special twin tank design for fuel storage which uh, packages the two tanks in the safest possible position between the rear firewall and the power unit and shrouds them with a coast of uh, specialist resin. Uh, standard primary and supplemental restraint systems include single stage driver and dual stage passenger multiple threshold front airbags plus there's a driver's knee bag uh, along with so-called smart vent side airbags, side curtain airbags with a rollover sensor and three point seat belts with a load limited automatic tensioning. If the promise of hybrid technology leaves you supposing that this is some kind of eco supercar in the mold of, say, a BMW i8, then you're likely to be disappointed. Unlike the i8, the, uh, this NXS isn't a plug-in product, and its hybrid system's one kilowatt hour lithium-ion battery is primarily designed to aid performance rather than efficiency. Still, you feel quite green-minded creeping silently away from your driveway with the integrated dynamic system set in its electrified quiet mode, and it's certainly true that this Honda enjoys a small fuel and CO2 statistical advantage over conventionally engined rivals. Officially, it's supposed to return 28.2 mpg on the combined cycle and 228 grams per kilometer of CO2. To give you some uh, perspective, a rival McLaren's 570S uh, manages 26.4 mpg and 249 grams per kilometer. Uh, Ferrari 488 delivers 24.8 mpg and 260 grams per kilometer. Must be a source of slight annoyance to Honda though that without any hybrid technology at all, a directly comparable Porsche 911 Turbo easily betters what's on offer here, returning 31 miles per gallon and 212 grams per kilometer. 
The fact that this hybrid NSX model's efficiency advantage is either slender or non-existent over conventionally engine rivals is perhaps to be expected. In the same way that the performance advantage of those extra motors is uh, to quite a large extent negated by the extra weight they bring, so it is with frugality and emissions. Uh, despite the structure's considerable use of aluminium and composite plastic uh, with all its associated and complicated systems, this Honda tips the scales at a hefty 1.8 tonnes. That's half a tonne more than the McLaren just mentioned. You need an awful lot of technological cleverness to overcome that. There is quite a lot of that though. Uh, a dual variable valve time and control system reduces the amount of exhaust gas recirculation, uh, reducing tailpipe emissions, which are further optimized by lean burn combustion technology and a combination of both direct and port fuel injection systems. Uh, there's even Honda's idle stop engine start stop system in quiet and sport modes anyway. And the 9 DCT dual clutch transmission and the EPS electrical steering both aid efficiency as does the sophisticated regeneration system which replenishes the battery to the accompaniment of a faint whine from the front motors as they switch into generator mode. Of course, when it comes to any sort of supercar, quoted efficiency readings are never particularly relevant, either to the priorities of potential owners or to the returns that you're actually likely to get in real-world motoring. Any model of this sort will struggle to reach a two-figure fuel return when it's being thrashed about or driven hard on track, and this one's no different. An info trip section of the Centre Dash Connect touchscreen has a history of trip section, and that can show you just how far from the officially quoted fuel readings your last four journeys have taken you and of course there are additional screens which brief you on average economy and range. It'd be nice to also have an active Synergy Drive style Prius like display showing what's been powered by what at any given time but Honda presumably thinks uh, that would be contrary to the performance priorities being showcased here. Service intervals are determined by the car's own SVRS service reminder system, uh, readouts for which you'll find in the instrument cluster display and the Centre Dash Connect screen. Maintenance is taken care of by the two UK London Honda dealerships in Hendon and Cheswick, which specialise in uh, NSX sales in our market. They'll collect and deliver your car for you by trailer. Uh, remember to allow more for consumables like brake pads and tyres if you're going to be indulging in the circuit events. Uh, the Continental Sport Contact 6 rubber will be extremely expensive to replace, so do bear that in mind before you go track day showboating. Insurance is, of course, a top of the shop group. 50, and the warranty is the usual three-year, 90,000-mile Honda deal, which is a bit better than most rivals who tend to offer guarantees limited to 60,000 miles. This segment is full of compelling supercars, but this NSX offers something a little different, just as its predecessor did. There's so much technology in the hybrid drivetrain that this model might easily have become something of an engineering exercise rather than a raw, involving super sports car. That this hasn't happened is clearly due to the fact that it's been developed by people who love their driving. A team who bought themselves just about every desirable rival that they could lay their hands on and then tuned each NSX element to try to make this Honda just that little bit better in every area. That must have been fun. Drive the end result and you'll find out just how much. But was all that sophistication really needed? The hybrid tech doesn't make this car especially efficient, and without it, you get a weight saving around 300 kilos that would probably give you back most of the extra performance that electrification delivers. But this Honda needed something to make it stand out. Delivering hybrid hypertech for entry-level supercar money certainly allows it to do just that. It's a machine that's greater than the sum of its parts, a pioneering contender in this class that sees its creator once again pushing boundaries. Like the original NSX, this one reinterprets what a supercar can be and delivers it with everyday usability that few competitors can match. It's unconventional, it's divisive, and it defines the spirit of its brand in a way that's charmed us completely.